Hello Tower Gaming players, this is Evan Jarvis, also known as Gripst, and welcome to my multi-table tournament strategy guide. My goals with this guide are to teach you everything you'll need to know to be a successful tournament player. I will start from the ground up with how to approach your first tournament and move on to what adjustments you will need to make throughout the various stages of a tournament. I will also introduce the MTT Pros Toolbox which outlines the specific moves that are necessary to get deep into a tournament and finally I will go over what adjustments you must make when playing satellite tournaments, extreme big field tournaments in the variety of 2000 players and over, and live events, be it a local $100 tournament with friends or a $10,000 buy-in such as the European Poker Tour, World Poker Tour, and of course the World Series of Poker main event. So without further ado, let's get the ball rolling and get your head in the right place for your first tournament. Your main goal should be pretty obvious when looking at multi-table tournaments, and that is to win the tournament. In most tournaments, about 50% of the prize money is divided up to the top three finishers. Now that's a lot of money. To make up for all those occasions, we will be busting out early, bubbling, or cashing for very small amounts, You've got to shoot for the big paying places to maintain a positive return on investment. And let's get serious. On top of the money, we play tournaments for the glory of winning it all. And you can only achieve that glory if you're the last man standing with all the chips and a big stack of cash getting shipped to your bankroll. It's easy to lose sight of the ultimate goal once the tournament actually gets started. A lot of common goals that will sidetrack us from the big one are making it to day two, a lot of players feel that if they bust in the first level, they've failed. While it is true that you've lost your shot at winning the tournament, if you get your money in as a big favorite and took a bad beat, you didn't really do anything wrong. At my latest live tournament, I heard a story about a player who was so focused on making it to the second day that in the last level of day one, with two all-ins ahead of her, she folded pocket aces. In a tournament with a progressive payout structure, there's simply no excuse for this. When you have a spot where you know 100% that you have an edge, you simply can't pass up on it. It turned out the other two players had pocket queens and pocket kings. The board ran out regs, and boy, was she steaming. You know, she ensured that she made it to the second day, and she accomplished her goal. But she greatly lowered her chances of winning the big money from the top spots. I'm not sure what happened to her, but I wouldn't be surprised if she cashed for the minimum or didn't even make it past the bubble. Speaking of the bubble, making it past the bubble is also a very common goal. When the money approaches and it's possible to get our buy-in back plus a little profit, people forget why they entered the tournament in the first place. They see a sure thing on the close horizon and make it a goal to make it to the money before they open up and go for the win. This creates one of the most profitable opportunities to chip up and build a big stack for the players who are willing to, you know, go for the win and not be afraid to bubble a tournament. For players who are unwilling to take chances due to fear of bubbling, it's almost impossible to win the big bucks. Moving on from the bubble, again, people focus on the small gains and lose sight of the big picture. The fact of the matter is, Moving up the payout structure increases your return on investment by a very small percentage. In fact, to double your money after cashing for the minimum, you often have to make it to the final two tables. And if you're playing to move up in the payout structure, you're probably not going to be able to make it that far. You'd be much better off taking some risks in the hopes of building a big stack that can take you to the final table. After all, you're already guaranteed your buy-in back, and you really have nothing to lose. Yes, the old saying, your tournament life is a very important one, and it's true. But unless you have a lot of big blinds, then your tournament life doesn't really hold much value. So in summary, always remember the main goal of making it to the top three spots where the big money is, and don't let your focus shift to anything else. A big misconception about tournaments is that we have to bust a lot of players. Let me make one thing clear. Even if you're the chip leader, it is never your job to take anyone out. Your goal is to give yourself the best chance at winning the thing, and if that means you do it by picking up small pots, stealing the blinds, then that's the game plan you should stick to. If you have a good opportunity to bust someone, then by all means take it, but if the situation never presents itself, don't worry. The other players will bust each other, and as long as you can coast along with a good-sized stack, you're doing the right thing. 
The only knockout you should ever worry about is the final blow heads up. And if you can make it to this stage of the tournament, you've succeeded regardless of the outcome. Building on the previous point, even if the field has 10,000 players, you don't have to literally beat 10,000 players. In a lot of online tournaments, one-third to one-half of the field will already be gone by the first break, and there's no way one player is single-handedly doing all that damage. In a tournament, you must focus on your table mates, the other five to nine players who you'll be spending the day with or the level with, and learning the best way to get their money, because that's the only thing you have power over. If a new player comes in, it's only one more guy to figure out, and if you get moved to a new table, okay, nine new guys to figure out but it's still you against your table, it's never you against the field. Keeping this idea of not being you against the field is very important. The chip leader in the early stages almost never ends up taking it down, so you should never worry about where you sit relative to the other stacks in the tournament. Players who focus on trying to be the chip leader by any means necessary often end up busting the very early stages and never give themselves a real chance to win. Tournaments are about making the most of the opportunities presented to you and changing gears when the time is right. Don't worry about where you stand after the first hour. Just be happy if you have chips. And yes, even someone who has five big blinds after the first hour still has plenty of opportunity to win. Victory is far down the road and any stack size can be navigated to first place. So remember, nobody ever won a tournament in the first level or in the case of a live tournament on the first day, but plenty of people have blown great opportunities by trying too hard to win every pot and boss their way to the final table. Now that you know what to think about in preparation for a tournament, let's look at things to remember once the cards are in the air and the chips are splashing around. The first one should be pretty obvious. Never forget about first place. You want to play your best poker, and when an opportunity presents itself that can aid you in your goal of making it to first place, you should take it. Never give up is something we also discussed earlier when looking at the early stages of a tournament. While it is much easier to play a big stack in a tournament, it is also very easy to give a big stack away due to feelings of invincibility. Whether you're sitting with 100 big blinds, 50 big blinds, 20 big blinds, 10 or even 5 big blinds, your job is the same. To stay within the rules of what your given stack size allows and to play it to the best of your ability. Different opportunities are available to you depending on what your stack size is and we will cover those in the following parts of this guide. The old saying a chip in a chair is not just a saying. It's based on actual fact. In 1982 Jack Strauss believed he was out of the tournament after losing an all-in confrontation. To his surprise he found a single 500 chip that was hidden underneath his drink. He maintained focus and made the best decisions he could and managed to come back to be the World Series of Poker main event champion, taking home $520,000. Not bad for someone who only had 500 of his original 10,000 chips. So next time you take a beat, and you're ready to fling in your last 8 big blinds with 8-3 suited, ask yourself if this is the best spot you will get before you get blinded off, or if you think a better one will present itself later in the tournament. Believe me, you will thank yourself many times over for doing this exercise. With our focus being winning the tournament, it should be clear that we should never pass up a profitable opportunity when it presents itself. While it is not always clear as to whether we are ahead or not, as was the case with our pocket aces story earlier where it was very clear that we had the best hand, given all the information available, you should be able to deduce if you're a favorite or not, or if you are getting the correct odds to gamble. Sure, folding and passing up coin flip opportunities where we have a small edge will increase our chances of survival, but they definitely won't increase our chances of hitting it big. If you get it in ahead and lose, there's always another tournament, and to be a winning tournament player, you should never pass up a spot where you are 60% favorite or better. With the fast pace of online tournaments, it's very rare that you can find a better spot, so it's up to you to identify when a good spot is being presented to you and to take it. You know that old city, Las Vegas? Yeah, the whole thing is an example of what a 1% edge can do. It started as nothing but a desert, and look at it now. Still not looking to take a little variance in your game? I didn't think so.
because your starting stack can become what Vegas is if you run good in these all-in situations with a small edge. In some cases, we can argue that it's not worth taking a gamble, as it doesn't give us the maximum odds of winning the tournament. This would be a situation where our table is very weak, and we can easily steal the blinds relentlessly to build our stack, rather than risking it on a big all-in confrontation. The better we are at chipping up and winning small pots, the more we're using our skill, and less, thus the less we have to allow luck into the game. With that being said, passing, passing up edges is the exception rather than the rule, and it is very rare that a player has won a big field tournament without dishing out at least a couple of bad beats. That wraps up the first part of my multi-table tournament guide, and I hope that at least some of this was new information to you and can get you thinking about tournament poker the right way. It's a super fun type of poker and extremely exhilarating when you can make it deep and have a shot at some serious money. So keep these ideas close to heart and you should see an improvement in your tournament results. Now, of course, I wouldn't be much of a teacher if I only provided you with these few tips and expected you to become a champion. So here's what you can look forward to in the next nine parts of this series. Lessons 2 through 4 will cover what adjustments you must make as the tournament progresses through the early stages, also known as the time to establish yourself and get comfortable. The middle stages, also known as the chip accumulation phase of the tournament. And the late stages where we will cover how to close out a tournament and give ourselves the best chance to win. Oh, and of course, we can't forget the final table, but that will be covered at the very end of the series once you've been fully prepared to arrive there. Lessons 5 and 6 will cover the arsenal of weapons, our tournament playbook, because this ain't your average cash game. Simply knowing how to play 100 big blind poker is not going to get you very far in a tournament. And that's why we're going to provide you with this playbook, with this arsenal of weapons to get you deep. We'll go over what you can and can't do with certain sack sizes, which is extremely critical to being a strong tournament player. I'll teach you the best way to build a big stack fast, and if you haven't figured it out yet, it's not in the first hour. And of course, finally, when to change gears. Lesson 7 will teach you satellite strategy to help you win your way into big events. And lessons 8 and 9 will go over how to navigate through those big field events, such as the championship, the 100k rebuy, which I might add is a personal favorite of mine. And of course, the big papa, the granddaddy of all tournaments, the one that made us all poker fans, the World Series of Poker main event. I look forward to sharing my strategies with you and helping you become a tournament champion. This has been Evan Jarvis for Tower Gaming. See you at the top.